Namaste. I'm delighted to introduce the best spokesperson for autism on the planet. Temple Brandon is professor of animal science at Colorado State University, and she designed humane animal corrals that are used throughout most of the world. Among her many honors, in 2017, Temple was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame. And in 2010, Time Magazine recognized her as among the 100 most influential individuals in the world in the category of heroes. That same year, there was an HBO movie called Temple Grandin, telling her life story. Temple has written 20 books and 60 peer-reviewed science papers. And uh, my introduction to Temple was in one of her earliest books called Thinking in Pictures. Here's my copy that I adored of Thinking in Pictures. Uh, Temple says that there are very few of these hard covers around anymore. But my appreciation of the book can be shown by the number of flags that I put in this book, which is it's clearly the winner of any book in my library. So you can imagine my pure delight when four years later, Temple asked if she could present at the 20th anniversary of Gifted Development Center. Uh, now we're celebrating 40 years, and Temple again, miraculously, asked if she could present for our community, and our conference had to be postponed. But Temple felt that it was very important to talk with you today about what your children need. Her latest book, Calling All Minds, and, and Temple will show you a picture of that in a second, is the subject of a 40-minute video that we're going to share after we have the interview and she answers questions. So please write down your comments and let us know your questions, and Temple will answer as many as she can after the interview is over. And thank you for joining us. Temple, you, you want to show them your book, Calling okay, All Minds. This is my book, uh, Calling All Minds. It's all of my childhood projects. I think one of the biggest mistakes a lot of schools made was taking uh, all the hands-on classes out of the schools. When I was in elementary school, having art and sewing and woodworking, those classes made school fun. I, and there are also a lot of classes I could excel in. I was good at those things. And my ability in art was always encouraged. So what do you think parents should be doing with their children this month that they're home all together? What do you well, think parents should do? Well, I think we're going to need to get on a schedule. I'm finding I've got to make myself get up. I got to be dressed for work by eight. They also are recommending this just to just anybody that has to work from home, do my writing in the morning, you know, do other things in the afternoon. I uh, get on some kind of a schedule. People are going to have to be living in cramped quarters. I just watched the most wonderful videos of life on the International Space Station. And you're talking about small quarters. They show off the bathrooms. They show off eating. They have fun with food, and some of the stuff look kind of yucky that they have to eat, but they're living in tight quarters. They have time where they can be alone. They have their work. They eat their meals together, and um, those might be some really fun videos to, to uh, watch, but also just look at that. That's cramped quarters, and having a structured schedule is important. So in uh, your video, you talked a lot about art and music and drama and dancing and creative writing and hands-on experiences and woodworking and all these kinds of uh, experiences that kids should be having. And if they're not having them at school, couldn't they have them at home? Well, absolutely. That's why, I did my, that's why I did my book, Calling All Minds, because I would spend hours tinkering with little kites and parachutes in order to get them to work. You see, I'm a total visual thinker. And if you watch the HBO movie, Temple Grandin, it shows my visual thinking perfectly. You know, that I could visualize um, everything I think about is a, a picture. And other students, they'll be a mathematical thinker. That's a pattern thinker. And then you've got the word thinker. So you've got the picture thinkers like me or object visualizers. You've got the math pattern thinkers, visual spatial. And then you've got the word thinkers. 
and the pattern thinkers, the math thinkers, they're all out in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, all these things like Zoom, that was made by more of the more mathematical kind of thinkers. And what are the kinds of activities that parents could be doing with their kids at home that would develop these visual thinking skills? Well, just a lot of different uh, projects, building things. I mean, I think Legos are really great, but then when I see a 16-year-old who's never been introduced to tools, I think that's terrible. I mean, I was yeah. using hammers and things like that in second and third grade, and I was taught to use them safely. I was using a little handsaw in fifth grade, using it carefully and safely. Um, but how's a kid going to find out if he likes tools if he doesn't get introduced to tools? And uh, those things I, I really liked. And I worked with a lot of brilliant skilled tradespeople when we were building some of the stuff in these big meat companies. And they were the dyslexic kids, the ADHD kids, some of them were the autistic kids, and we got turned around by that shop teacher. And people underestimate the importance of visual thinking in, in building things and making things. And what about creative writing? You said creative writing would be a good thing for these kids. Well, the word thinkers need to be doing writing. And one of the big problems I'm seeing now in college students is they're not learning writing. They're not learning how to like <clears throat> do a book report, get their ideas together, you know, form sort of a, <clears throat> a basic argument about something. And part of this is um, they're not having the teachers aren't marking up the work. But I'm kind of appalled just in the last five years in college students, some are really awful writing skills. And it gets back to what's going on in the schools. They're not writing enough compositions and having them marked up to learn how to write. But not just verbal thinkers. But You're a visual thinkers. thinker, but you've done so much writing. You had to have writing skills too. I did. And one of the reasons why I did, fifth and sixth grade, I had to write book report where I had to summarize a book and then give my opinion of it. And the teacher would red mark it all up. And then I had to correct it. And that's how I learned writing. Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in the video that I really, that grabbed my attention was how many hours it took you to drive on dirt roads and how important the skill of driving was for you before you could integrate that with traffic and other people driving. And I thought, right now, the parking lots are empty. And right now, if you have a teen at home, uh, the way Temple was taught to drive would be a great activity, a perfect time for teenagers to learn to drive where there's no traffic. There's no traffic, and if you don't get out of the car, you're maintaining it by your security. And uh, you see, the thing is, I have problems with, with multitasking. And in order to learn to deal with traffic, I had to get the operation of the car totally into my motor memory. And my aunt's mailbox was three miles away from the ranch. So that was 36 miles a week to pick up the mail. And I did about 200 miles on dirt roads before I touched traffic. So what I recommend with these kids where they have some problems with multitasking and working memory is lots and lots of practice. Start out in great big parking lots. Perfect place to start out. A lot of the roads are half deserted. Those are really good places to learn driving. And now is a ideal time because there's less traffic to deal with. Now I want the I want well, most of the kids I want to start in the middle of a big parking lot first. So with the well, car there's lots of around there's absolutely lots. nothing to hit. Lots of empty parking lots. Oh you want um, to see the satellite pictures of the Denver airport and <laughs> the parking lot only had two tiny rows of cars on it. <laughs> so why do you think parents should limit screen time? Well, the problem is some of these kids are getting so addicted to video games, they're not doing anything else. What I'm saying that a lot of kids that get a label, whether it's dyslexic, ADHD, autistic, whatever the label is, I'm saying one kid ends up in the basement playing video games and the other kid's out doing things. And yeah, we have to limit it, limit the video game playing. If they were becoming video game designers, I would not be criticizing it. But that's not what I, what's happening. In fact, in my latest edition of The Way I See It book, one of the most basic books on autism, The Way I See It, I just updated the chapter on video gaming, and I've looked into some of the research, and unfortunately, kids in the autism spectrum are more prone to getting addicted to video games. But now let's that, say you have a kid that's a video game addict. That is true. What you've got to do is wean them off of it, but you've got to replace it with something else. And just this year, I talked to two boys that found out that working on cars 
and making uh, robots was a lot more fun than video games. So what you got to do is gradually replace the video game with something else. This boy now, he was all Epps, horrible student, got introduced into mechanics. He is now fixing trains for the railroad. That's the kind of outcome I like to see and just loving it. So during this period of time when parents and kids are together at home, am I, t tell me if I'm uh, representing you correctly. I would say that Temple believes you should find out what your kids strengths are. Find out what they're really good at and what they love and learn how to develop those strengths. Am I right about that? Yeah, you want to develop here? those strengths. And, and uh, you know, your math kids, I see a lot of situations where a kid's super good at math and he's doing baby math and then he's become a behavior problem. We'll move them ahead. There's all kinds of stuff online. You've got Khan Academy, you've got Coursera, free college classes, you've got free programming stuff online. There's all kinds of stuff that they could be doing. And you said it's very important to stretch people, not to let them just stay in their comfort zone. You said that your parents, your mother pushed you outside your comfort zone, but she gave you choices. That's Can right. Can you talk more about that? Well, for example, on, uh, when I was 15 years old, the opportunity came to, to leave New York where we were living and fly out to my aunt's ranch. And I was really scared to go. And mother gave me a choice, one week or all summer, and well, not going wasn't a choice. And when I got out there, I loved it. So this brings up another important thing. How to end up in the cattle industry? Because I was exposed to it when I was 15. So if kids don't try some new things, there's no way they're going to discover there might be new things they might just like. Well, exposure, this, this seems like a very good time for exposure. What do you want twice exceptional kids to know, especially now in this time in their lives? Well, they can get out there and do great things. When I was out, uh, one of the things they can go into a skilled trade. Let me tell you, that's essential right now. Skilled trades people are all out there working. When I was out working with the large meat plants, I'm going to estimate that about 20% of the super brilliant welders and designers I was working with would be the autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I've been out to Silicon Valley, big rooms full of programmers. They avoid the labels. Most of half those programmers would be on the autism spectrum and they got great jobs. I, I, I've, they're, I'm having grandparents come up to me all the time and the grandparent will say to me, oh, I found out I was on the autism spectrum when the kids got diagnosed. But one of the reasons why granddaddy had a job is because granddaddy had a paper route at age 11. And the big problems I'm seeing today is not learning how to work. That needs to start at an early age with chores. I think kids can learn chores as early as three. Oh, I think they can do just simple things. like help, you know, pick up some of the stuff, you know, from the table. Just really simple yes, things. Yeah, folding, folding the wash. Yeah, that's right. They can start learning those things. And when you watch, I watch these really cool space station videos. And I think they'd be good things for people to watch. You've got a cramped bathroom. You've got a cramped place. They eat together, but people have got to get along in this cramped space, and they're going to have to keep it clean. They're just hilarious. There's a really fun thing with flinging pizza around. Uh, they do some food play. But so they, this, then each person this, has their own, like their own space, too, where they can talk to their family on their computer, read books. And so at this important moment in history, what do you want the world to know? Well, it's, um, you know, difficult times. One of the reasons why I was looking at the space station videos and is that it might help you, how do you get along when you're in cramped quarters? You know, one of the things they have, they're on a schedule, but then they have time for by themselves time. Uh, you know, where they can read a book or they can uh, talk to their family or watch a movie by themselves or some other thing. So, uh I'm wondering, Joy, if we have some questions from the people who are watching that Temple can answer? Yes, I have a couple questions. The first one, can you talk about evaluating teen girls who are gifted and possibly Asperger's or have sensory processing disorder or high anxiety? Well, the thing is, there's a lot of crossover. The thing that's not good is that when I go to a meeting for Twice Exceptional, you've got a totally different set of books on the book table than when I go to a meeting for autism. 
but then a lot of the symptoms overlap. I mean, I saw a lot of kids there that I know had autism traits. And then I go to a workshop on social skills and I go, that sounds like an autism meeting. You know, we need to be getting out of these silos because a lot of these kids that are really smart, they are socially awkward. A brain can be more thinking or a brain can be more social emotional. I just read a new paper today that autism has a very, very strong um, genetic basis. Now here's a paper that's a mind blower. Genomic trade-offs are autism and schizophrenia, the steep price for a human brain. The same genes that make the brain big, that give us a great big brain also cause autism and schizophrenia. It's uh, very embedded into brain development. I think I saw that paper also. Okay, but I didn't get a chance to read it. So I'm not sure. I, I, I think that what, what I remember in just the abstract was that it, if we are going to have larger brains that can do more complex things, we have to understand that autism or schizophrenia are part, and part of the picture, that that's going to happen with bigger brains. Well, bigger it's brains are hard a, to make. Yeah. And they can vary, and they can vary a whole lot. But we got to start working on what the kid can do. I like what Stephen Hawking said about disability. He, he told a New York Times reporter, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. And he could do math in his head well. Now, I can't multitask well. I can't do algebra. I'm worried that us visual thinkers are going to get screened out by draconian algebra requirements. But you need us to prevent messes like Fukushima, messes like the Boeing Max uh, crash. They trusted a single very delicate angle of attack sensor that's about the size of a large pen. And you're gonna trust this sticking out, out, out the side of an airplane, have that wired directly up to the flight controls. See, the problem is they didn't see the angle of attack sensor getting broken. You see, that's something I would see. I see a bird just ripping that thing off and well, they were in a lot of trouble when that happened. You see, you need visual thinkers. And what I've found on, on designing a great big food processing plant, us visual thinkers do what I call the clever engineering department. Clever packaging machinery, really clever equipment, complicated conveyor systems. Your mathematical degreed engineers will do boilers, refrigeration, and the framework of the building, water, and power requirements. And the thing is, you need both the visual thinker well, I'm very concerned getting screened out by algebra requirements. I can't do algebra. It doesn't make any sense to me. And you, you had said that your brain doesn't process algebra and your brain doesn't, you have a wonderful long-term memory, but your brain's short-term memory is very weak. Well, I have no short-term memory. Uh, you give me a phone number, I have to write it down in order to dial it. So... We are putting a lot of pressure on kids to do things very fast and to do put a lot of information in short-term memory and then spit it out. And then when they don't have good short-term memory and they don't have fast processing speed, then we treat them like they're losers. But the and thing they're is, not going to, be successful. to do something like, okay, my designs, you can go on to... Google images and type in Temple Grandin drawings, you can see some of my designs. Uh, that does not require short-term memory. I can pull all of that stuff out of long-term memory. Somebody's really good at a skilled trade, they see it in their head. You don't need to be using all that work, you know, working memory. Um, algebra, there's nothing there to visualize. Um, kids that are bad at algebra need to go jumping right into geometry. Well, geometry is much more visual. That's right. And I don't see where geometry follows algebra at all sequentially and why we should have first they have algebra before they take geometry. In Japan, they take geometry in kindergarten. Well, you see, and I do some geometry and some of the things that, that I've designed. And then I look at things like um, uh, protein symmetry. Look protein symmetry up on Google Images. You'll be amazed at the beautiful geometric patterns that you find and they're part inside the body and uh, they're part of biology. And they look like uh, stained glass window patterns. Wow. I it have, would be beautiful to draw. 
No, you just have to type protein symmetry into Google Images and you will find them. Use those two keywords. Linda, can Do you I? put your phone down? Thank you. Um, I have a few more questions for Tim that are coming in. A nine-year-old daughter would like to ask, how did you feel when living with your aunt? How did well, you think, oh, sorry. How did I'm you feel so when living with your aunt? Well, I really liked it. I got out to the ranch. I was afraid to go originally, but then when I got out there, I just loved it. That's why we've got to get, you know, kids to do new things. Um, give them some choices. I went to a really great summer camp in Kearney, Nebraska, and parents would go, you got my autistic kid on a boat? Like, you got to be kidding. Well, they got him on a boat, and you find out he likes it. Now, the one thing you want to be careful about is no surprises. You let them look at the boat. You let them watch other people go on the boat. So it's not a surprise. Thank you. How did you think of the design for the first working pins? Well, what I did, I'm a bottom-up thinker. So I went to every feed yard in Arizona. I went to a lot of feed yards in Texas, and there were some curved facilities. So what I did was I, I started to see patterns of design mistakes I'd see repeatedly. And what I basically did is I took all the good bits, put them together into new systems. I described that right in the first chapter of, of thinking in pictures. It's bottom up thinking. Education and word base, very top down. I had a lot of questions on another autism meeting I just did on Zoom. Okay, well, should my kid be in an inclusive classroom? Well, I didn't get any detail. I don't even know anything about their kid. So, you know, very top down, no detail. I tend to take the bottom up. I want specifics. You know, this particular classroom at this particular school might be right for this kid and bad for another kid. Thank you. My 10-year-old daughter would like you to describe what is it like to be autistic and gifted? Well, when I first started out, I thought everybody thought in pictures the way I did. I didn't know that my thinking was different. And it's been a journey for me learning that my thinking was different. And I started with thinking in pictures. It goes into much more detail in my book, uh, The Autistic Brain, where I present some of the scientific research for different kinds of thinking. I've got even more of the studies in this book right here on the, uh, the visual thinking and the mathematical thinking. They're, they're two different kinds of thinking. Scientific terms are object visualizer and visual spatial for the uh, two kinds of thinking. And and then to understand how my thinking is really, really different. It's also uh, been difficult, hard for me to understand how people's emotions are different. I've always liked Mr. Spock on Star Trek data because they think the way I think. <laughs> That's fun. Um, how do we explain the coronavirus to our kids? Well, one thing that helped me to deal with it is I researched and found out there's drugs that can be used to treat it, existing drugs. We need to learn how to use them. Now, one of the drugs that Trump was uh, promoting, um, it may work, but it does have some toxicity issues. So it has to be used really carefully. People have done stupid things, um, like taking the fish aquarium version of it and dying. That's really stupid. Um, but finding out that there were drugs that may work, drugs that are on the pharmacy shelf that already exist, that made me feel better. Now I'm being super careful because I am in the at-risk uh, group. But there's things we need to learn. One of the things we don't know is if you've already had COVID, how long does the immunity last? That's unknown. You know, hopefully if it lasts a long time, that's gonna solve a lot of problems. But right now they've got to do social distancing because the hospitals will be completely overburdened otherwise. Yes, absolutely. To your knowledge, how are people with autism reacting to the current crisis, our global pandemic? I think it depends upon the family. I think one of the things is having a schedule where we're going to get up, we're going to do a schoolwork. Uh, I recommend looking at some of these space station videos because that's going to give you a lot of ideas about living in a cramped space. Uh, they uh, did a tour of the bathroom there. Uh, if you're an astronaut that was dirty about the bathroom, that's not going to make you very popular on the space station because you are living in a in a cramped place. Um, but I think uh, having some structure, you know, that's the time we're gonna work, then we're gonna eat together, maybe we'll play some board games. That's good for little autistic kids on teaching turn-taking, um, do chores, um, maybe then go out and go for a walk. If you have a dog, you can walk it. 
but get on some kind of a schedule. Put some structure back in. In other words, you got to make a new routine. I think that's going to help a lot. Yes. My 10-year-old daughter wants to know how a gifted kid can get their voice heard. Get their voice heard? One of the things I learned is when you're weird, what you have to do is sell your work. So the way I would sell jobs is I would show off my, um, some of my drawings. And if you watch the video on um, Calling All Minds of Temple Grand, then some of my drawings are shown in that. And people thought it was weird, but then I'd whip out a great big drawing and show it. And people were impressed by that. And I showed pictures of jobs. That's showing off the portfolio. I sold my work rather than myself. That's what I did. That's how I sold jobs. I also wrote about things I built in the farm magazines. So writing was a very important part of my career. Thank you. What's the best way to evaluate students' spatial abilities? I guess either of you could answer. Well, there's uh, the two different, I see as a visualizer, I've, there's a thing called a grain test. And that's being able to visualize what different things are like almost photographically. And um, then for the visual spatial, uh, rotating objects in space, I'm not that good at that. You see, there's two kinds of visual of visualization. There's picture thinking or object visualizer. That is me. And then there is the visual spatial pattern thinker. Think patterns instead of pictures. That's your more mathematical thinker. And then some people can kind of be mixtures of the two kinds of thinking. And there's scientific research now to back this up. So I would like to take a stab at that. <clears throat> we have um, a visual spatial identifier that they can uh, contact Gifted Development Center and we can tell, we can have them complete it. That's one way. But the thing is visual thinkers at a young age, like second, third, or fourth grade, will usually be, in, be into Legos and they'll also be into drawing. They'll be good at art. That will show up. Your mathematical thinkers will be good at math. Don't bore them with baby math. Let them go ahead and do some more complicated math. Maybe a, a fourth grader can do some high school math. Let them do it. Let them do totally it. totally agree. I mean, it will show up uh, just on its own. Okay, I have another question, but there was a fun comment that I wanted to share from Connie. Dr. Grandin, I wish to thank you for giving hope to this Grammy for our, from our conversation at the CAGT 2018 keynote. You pointed to me to ask the first question. I shared that my four-year-old granddaughter is nonverbal. You told me to have hope that she will talk, and a year later she is. Good. She uses an app on her iPad to help her talk, but she says the most important word, Grammy. <laughs> well, good. And um, we have to start looking more at what they can do. Let's develop the area of strength. For me, it's going to be visual thinking. There's a point where pounding away on algebra is stupid, and I'm saying kids kept out of skilled trades because they can't do algebra, but boy, you ought to see the thing that's the things that they can build. And we've lost skills. Like let's take in our meat industry, for example, a lot of equipment that used to be designed and built here comes from Europe now. And the reason for that is they've kept their skilled trades. And I'm talking complicated food processing equipment. So I, I would like to make a comment about that one too. Um, a lot of kids who talk late have some central auditory processing issues. And my experience has been that when they talk late, they are developing the visual circuitry in their brains instead of the verbal circuitry. And so they do end up being the early builders. Well, I, I don't, I, I can't really comment on that, but the thing is there definitely are, uh, you know, the object visualizers and then the visual spatial, more mathematical minds. And there's getting me more and more research on that. I keep digging up papers on that. You need to use the search terms object visualizer, that's me, and visual spatial for the mathematical kind of mind. That's the way the papers are written. Um, but take that thing the kid is good at. Um, introduce the mathematical kids to programming. You've got scratch programming, then learn some JavaScript. That's what Minecraft works on. I uh, learn some Python, learn some of the, um, the computer languages. 
and some kids may really grab onto that. It wasn't for me. I tried taking Fortran and it didn't work. Now I'm really showing my age. In fact, interestingly enough, Bill Gates and I were exposed to the exact same computer. And uh, he, he, he was in high school, I was in college, and boy, the bug bit for him and it didn't bite for me. I wanted to program the computer, but I just <laughs> couldn't do it. But we, we were exposed to the exact same computer. Wow, fun. Okay, here's another question. I'm a gifted educator and know building relationships is so important. How can I continue to keep my students motivated and learning during this difficult time? Well, I didn't maybe get, you know, Zoom conferences going. Um, uh, I had friends who shared interests. I got a lot of problems with bullying in school. Uh, get some things going with, uh, with making things and they can do show and tell online and, and uh, we just got to get creative on, on doing stuff. Look, this really fun thing on the space station, um, having fun on the space station. They're very, very creative. Basketball on the space station, you bounce it off the ceiling and down into the basket. So yeah, they're creativity. Really, they're really fun videos of, of a living, they're living in a cramped space up there. And some of the foods, well, the, their Thanksgiving dinner food, I thought was just yucky. <laughs> So you, you talked a lot in the video about the importance of creativity. And I, I agree with you that we need to be, be doing more creative stuff with our kids. No, I would agree with that. And, and, um, and I'm worried that a lot of smart thinkers, especially the visual thinkers like me, are getting screened out because we can't do algebra. And so you can't graduate from high school. Now, what you can do is you can go in the back door. I've seen a lot of people going to the meat industry where they'd come in and get a job on the line, then they'd be over in the maintenance department. Ten years later, they're building a new plant addition. There's a back door in many industries. Okay, once we get over with this whole COVID mess, you could get a job in an Amazon warehouse and learn how to fix the robots and learn how to fix the conveyors. And ten years later, you'll be building the next warehouse. I've seen that happen in the, in the uh, meat industry. There's a gigantic back door where you can get in just starting off as a line employee and you got to learn every job on that floor, whether it's a warehouse or whether it's a meat plant, learn every job. And 15 years later, you're building the new plant. I have seen that happen. I've been in my industry for 47 years. I've seen people do that. Wow. Cool. Here's another question. What should I do? My son excels and loves math stuff, but not spelling. We homeschool and he's profoundly gifted. Should I insist more on where he's lacking or keep letting him fly? Well, I want to keep flying on the things he's good at. I've got to get reading. Math minds tend to be bad at reading and writing. I've got to get that up to a level, uh, basically good sixth grade level, a really good sixth grade level of reading and writing. You're just fine. You can run a Fortune 500 company on that. I've, I've <laughs> been in enough boardrooms saying that seriously. Uh, there's spell check now but I've got to get the spelling and the reading and writing up to probably to a good sixth grade level and he can function just fine in a tech company with that. But I do need that level of reading and writing. And when but I spelling, a high level of reading and writing in terms of just what things that you got to do in a business. Spelling is just not that important. Well, spelling in is the a long run. Check. Where I'm seeing the problems with students is they can't write a coherent proposal letter or something like that. How do you put your thoughts on a one-page proposal letter? I'm having a, I've, I've got a student right now, I'm working with her to, to summarize why her welfare issue that she's working on with Dairy Cows is important. How do you tell people that in an introductory paragraph? A lot of students are not learning that sort of thing. I, I want that skill if I'm going to hire somebody. I don't, they don't have to know, you know, super advanced stuff, but I've got to have a decent sixth grade level where they know how to write a book report. I summarize agree. the book, summarize the book, and critique it. Yeah. Thank you. What can we do to overcome the social stigmatization of autism and disability in general? Show what you can do. What I did was I showed off my work. Stephen Hawking was very disabled, but he was very good at doing math in his head. He concentrated on the thing his disability didn't prevent him from doing well. That's what he told the New York Times. Show what you can do. You know, you go out to Silicon Valley, half those programmers are on the spectrum and they avoid the labels. This brings up an important thing about identity. 
autism is an important part of who I am, but it's secondary to being a college professor, being a scientist. That comes first. And show what you can do. Artwork, music. It could be a lot of different, uh, computer programming. It could be all kinds of stuff. And the tech companies are hiring right now. I don't know if they're hiring right now this minute with COVID, but up until COVID hit, they were definitely, definitely hiring. How can we help our kids on the spectrum to make friends? Friends who shared interests. I got bullied and teased in high school, but the thing, places where I had a shared interest, like horses, model rockets, and electronics, the kids that did the bullying did not do those activities. In fact, I got a paper online uh, just titled How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism Make Friends and Learn How to Work. Uh, friends who shared interests. It, it could be a school play. It could be music, it could be a, a book club, it could be a lot of different things. In fact, book clubs are something that can be done online really easily because they usually tend to be small groups. You could have a Zoom conference robotics. about uh, the books that have been read. Or robotics. Robotics is great. In fact, the kid that was the video game addict, what saved him is his mom ran the robotics team and kept him in robotics even though he's flunking algebra and then he, he got into a mechanics uh, school, and now he's fixing trains for the railroad. And really good at it. How do, how do you keep gifted kids happy in a world that doesn't understand them? Well, one of the things I, you know, be good at what you do. You know, uh, some kind of field where people appreciate your knowledge of some specialized field. It could be computer programming, it could be math, it could be art. Um, it could be, like I, for me, it was cattle handling equipment design. I worked very, very hard to make myself really good at a specialized thing, and I, it was a lot of work. My answer to that is find other gifted people to appreciate you. Well, and, and um, what a way I would sell a job, my idea of an interview is I just go in there and spread the drawings out. In fact, in the movie, that scene where I'm at the uh, desk with the guys, that's one of my actual drawings on that table that they animated those cattle over. Now it's a copy of a drawing, but it is one of my actual drawings. I love the fact that my drawings appeared in the movie. Sorry, here we go. How, oh. What do you think the best thing we can do as teachers is to support students in our classrooms and social areas as well as academics? Well, um, little kids need to learn how to take turns at games. That's really important. But starting clubs, one innovative teacher, um, I think it was like fifth grade student with autism and they started a Star Wars club. And then other kids joined that and then the kid got some friends. That was starting a club, friends who shared interests. Thank you. I think we're about through the questions that have come in. We can wait a second, but do you have any final thoughts you want to well, share? We need to be working on what the kid's good at doing. The other thing is kids have got to learn work skills. So it's going to start with chores. And, um, you know, okay, now that everybody's cooped up in the house, um, everyone's going to have to work on, the, you know, keeping the house clean and, and getting along together. Um, even now, you could walk, he could walk, a kid could walk a dog for a neighbor um, because they need to learn how to do a task on a schedule outside the family. Then the instant they're legal getting real jobs. One of the biggest problems I'm seeing is kids aren't learning how to work. But I, I recommend watching these uh, Life on the International Space Station. Um, there's a whole lot of real, there's really fun videos, but there's also videos that just show how each astronaut has his little private place with his pictures of his pets and his wife and his kids. And they've got to get along in <coughs> cramped quarters. They're, they're really fun mm -hmm. videos. I just was looking at them for about half an hour before I came on. Life on the International Space Station. Just, just type that whole title in and you'll find them. So what we're going to do now is show your video. 
it's a 40 minute video that you did for Qualcomm. And what is Qualcomm? Qualcomm is a company that makes chips that go in all, in many of the phones. And you did it's a, that. It's, it's, a, it's a tech company, and and uh, it was uh, you know then when this whole COVID thing hit, and I had to get my classes online and everything. I'm like going all over YouTube trying to find decent videos that I had, and that was one of them. It's recent, and it, it, they did a very nice job of producing it too. Yes, and how long ago was that? No, it was 2019. It's it's uh, it's really oh, it's recent. a brand new one. Yeah, it's and recent. And you talk about. You talk about your book, Calling All Minds. Yes. In that in that video, I I found it fascinating. I I hope that other people are going to enjoy watching it too. If as you're watching the the film, you have other questions. Temple has two websites that you can send. Oh, Grandon.com. He doesn't do comments. Just send them to TempleGrandon.com. Oh, okay. Or it might, the, it might be some questions they can send them to you and then you could forward them on to me. Okay, the other one, grandon.com, is just for information about livestock. animals and livestock. It's all about She's livestock. Got, it's all about livestock, but her templegrandon.com is the one that she frequently answers questions for parents. She's been a fantastic advocate for parents of autistic children and parents of twice exceptional kids. She's been a wonderful resource for the entire international community. So Temple, thank you very much for uh, offering us this interview time with you. This was a great, great pleasure and an honor. Okay, well, thank and you very, very much.